Good morning. The scripture reading today is from the letter of 1 Timothy. Most of the letters in the New Testament are from the Apostle Paul to small groups of Jesus followers in a given city, groups we would call churches. But this letter is from Paul to an individual, Timothy, who was a co-worker with Paul in starting churches. New gatherings of Jesus followers, Paul was a mentor to Timothy, thinking of him as someone who would carry on Paul's work after Paul was killed. Rather than focusing on the theological foundation of his faith, as do letters such as Romans and Galatians, this letter focuses on more practical matters, like qualifications for church leadership and everyday moral teaching. Paul wants to make sure Timothy understands what the churches should be like going forward. Among other things, Paul directly and pretty extensively addresses how money and wealth should be dealt with among the followers of Jesus. So, from the sixth chapter of the letter of 1 Timothy. <clears throat> of course, a devout life, combined with being content with what one has is a great gain. For what we brought, for we brought nothing into the world and therefore we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with just that. But those who pursue excess wealth fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that drown people, resulting in ruin and death. For the love of money is a root of many kinds of evil, and in coveting riches some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, person of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, devoutness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the life of the age to which you were called and to which you honorably committed yourself in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the honorable confession to keep the will, to keep the commandment without fault or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about at the right time. The blessed and only sovereign one, the one to whom all rulers and other leaders are subject, it is that God alone, who is not subject to death and who dwells in approachable light, the one whom no one has ever seen or can see, to God be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age have more than enough, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of their abundance, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for us to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works and generosity, communalists, thus storing up for themselves a good endowment for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. Let us pray. Most gracious God, indeed, we walk by faith, that is by trust and not by sight, for what you are doing in the world is sometimes difficult to see, but give us the eyes this day to see it, to see it in your word, to see it in your love to see it among each other, even to see it in this world, O oh God, for then we will be able to live into it, to truly walk with trust in you. We thank you for this opportunity that we have now to attend to your ancient word, the word that is yet alive among us. And we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts 
will be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You can see on the cover of the worship order today that my topic is kindness. Of course, this is the second week of our series on kindness. We are trying to work that theme into many different aspects of the life of the church in, the wor- in, in this fall season. Specifically, as you can see, the topic today is kindness as it applies to finances. And even more specifically, kindness as it applies to the way Paul, St. Paul, thinks about finances as it is presented to us in the letter of 1 Timothy that was read for us earlier. And to boil it all down, to make sure that nobody misses this if they have to leave early today, the basic message, if St. Paul himself is our financial advisor is you can't take it with you. It's a well-known line. I'm not sure that most of us realize that it comes from Scripture, but that is indeed uh, one modern way to express those words that are right there in 1 Timothy We brought nothing into the world, and therefore we can take nothing out of it. The formulation of you can't take it with you really didn't become popular until the 1930s, but the original is there in 1 Timothy. To dig into that a little bit more, I want to tell you about uh, a rich old man. There was a rich old man who, like a lot of people, figured that all he had was a blessing from God. He was confused by the old line, though, not understanding why, if God gave it to him to begin with, he shouldn't be able to take it with him when he went to meet God. So this old man, this old rich man, was determined to prove the saying wrong. Nearing death, he made a plan. He asked his wife to go to the bank and withdraw enough $100 bills to fill up two large duffel bags. He then had her take the duffel bags up to the attic and leave them directly above the bed, his deathbed, where he was dying. When he died, he planned to reach out and grab the bags as he ascended up to heaven. Well, this old man did indeed die, and a few months after the funeral, the wife was cleaning out her husband's junk from up there in the attic, and much to her surprise, she came upon the two forgotten duffel bags full of cash. Oh, that old fool, she said. I knew I should have put the money in the basement. (laughs) Okay, good. You can't take it with you. I had a lot of really great teachers in seminary. One of them was an old professor of New Testament named Dwight Moody Smith. Some of you may recognize that name, Dwight Moody. We still have the Moody Bible Institute right here in Chicago. Indeed, my New Testament professor was named after that great evangelist of the earliest 20th century. Dwight Moody Smith went on to get a Ph.D. from Yale. He studied at Cambridge. He wrote a textbook that used to be used in probably most of the Bible 101 classes in the world. And a few years ago, he was considered really the world's leading expert on the Gospel of John. When it came to the Bible, the guy knew his stuff. And... He was rather kind, 
a very kind older man, but he was also rather old school and impatient in his teaching style. On the first day of class, like this is, this is literally my first day of seminary when I was 22 years old. The first day of class, my first class in the New Testament, he explained that he wasn't just there to teach, but to unteach as well. He knew that if we, as his students, were really to understand the New Testament, we needed to unlearn much of what we had supposedly learned about the New Testament. Clearing the swamp, he called it. So the first day of class went something like this, and I'm going to reenact it here among us today. Class, let's start at the beginning. Someone with a Bible, open it up to the very beginning of the New Testament. Somebody's really going to have to do this. This is what we did in class. Somebody with a Bible, open it up to the very beginning of the New Testament. Tell me what it says. First page of the New Testament. I'm waiting. What's that? What's even before that? What comes first? The gospel according to Matthew. That's right. The gospel according to Matthew. The very first word not minding the definite article. That's the kind of guy he was. He paid attention to grammar. Not minding the definite article. The very first word is gospel. Gospel means good news. So what is the good news of the New Testament? What's the main message? Yes, I'm waiting for answers. What's the gospel? Jesus Christ, love. That's all we got? Redemption. What's that? Salvation. No. 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 And no. That is not the good news. The good news, the main message of the New Testament is that in and through Jesus of Nazareth, the kingdom of God is breaking into this world. I want you all to write it up there on the top of your first page of your notes. As a matter of fact, write it on the front cover of your notebook. This is when, like, people still had spiral notebooks. You remember those? We took notes in them and then went back and looked at them. Yeah, some of you remember. <laughs> write it there on the cover of your notebook. The good news is that in and through Jesus of Nazareth, the kingdom of God is breaking into this world. And then sometimes, you know, he was old, we were 22, he kind of treated us like children. He said, so you're going to repeat it after me. The good news, the good news. is that in and through Jesus of Nazareth, the kingdom of God is breaking into this world. That is right. Over the force of four grueling months of listening to lectures and reading ridiculous amounts of scholarship about the New Testament and writing ridiculously long papers, we got the message. And we learned that everything we thought we knew about the New Testament, all of it that 
God is love, like someone said. Salvation, forgiveness, for Jesus forgives our sins. Love your enemy, whatever it was. All of it could be understood only in light of that main message. In Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God is breaking into this world. Now, the New Testament says this same thing in a lot of different ways. The kingdom of God is near. The day of the Lord is at hand. The rich have been sent away empty and the lowly have been lifted up. The home of God is among mortals. God will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or, mourning or crying or pain for any more, for the former things have passed away. And behold, I am making all things new. A little bit of a representative sample of the different ways the New Testament expresses that good news, that in Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God is breaking into this world. Now, just to be clear, again, remember, he's kind of a grammar nut. Note that the verb that my professor used in his summary of the good news is what grammar geeks call a present continuous verb. The kingdom of God is breaking in to this world. In Jesus, this breaking in has already begun. If you are in the middle of an ocean in a shink sinking ship, you really don't want to hear someone say, someone will come and save you. What you want to hear is they are here. The rescue is beginning. But a present continuous verb also expresses action that is not yet complete. Is breaking in means that the process is not done yet. The rescue is happening but everyone is not out of the water yet. Or again, to put this in a little bit of a different language because the New Testament uses lots of ways to describe it, the new age has begun, but the old age isn't over yet. Jesus Christ is the blessed and only sovereign one, the one to whom all rulers and leaders will bow, but they don't admit it yet. Now, and I'm not getting all Gwyneth Paltrow on you here, so don't worry, but the new age has begun, although the old age is hanging on. What being a follower of Jesus is all about is living in the new kingdom that is breaking in. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. It means trusting that Jesus is the ruler of the new world that is breaking into the old world. It's to take the leap of faith that all the rulers of the old world are on limited time. Their way, the way of violence, of riches, of guilt, of fear, of death, all of it, their time is coming to an end. That way has no future. The only viable future lies in the way of Jesus of Nazareth. Self-giving love, generosity of spirit, sharing of wealth, forgiveness of self, forgiveness of others, peace. These things are 
of the kingdom, and the kingdom is breaking in right now. So we might as well take the leap and live for the ruler of the new world. First Timothy is a passage that focuses like a laser beam on what that means in one area of Christian life, one aspect of leaving the old world behind and taking the leap of faith into the new world. It focuses, as does indeed much of the New Testament, on wealth. And there is so much about wealth in the New Testament because there are few things that anchor us to the old dying world more than wealth. The pursuit of it, the protection of it, the love of it. Paul says that all of it causes a world of trouble. In another phrase that's so common, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So what to do? How to handle it? Well, Paul gives some very concrete advice to his young protege, Timothy, and to the church that Timothy leads. He says, as for those who in the present age, that is the old age, have more than enough, command them not to be haughty or set their hopes on the uncertainty of their abundance, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for us to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works and generosity, communalists, thus storing up for themselves a good endowment for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. In other words, those who in the present age the dying age, the failing age, the age that has no future, those who now have more than enough, be rich in good works, be generous, be communalists, which, because... People like Karl Marx and Stalin and Engels have stolen the proper use of this term from us. The word in the New Testament could really be translated better as communists. Be communists. Those who truly live in common with others. Because doing these things allows you to set up a good endowment for the future so that you may grab hold of the life that really is life. Grab hold of the kingdom that is breaking in now. Letting go of that wealth. Letting go of that love of everything that is attached to this age, this dying age. That is how you grab hold of the kingdom that is breaking in now in Jesus. So, you can't... You can't... Take this with you. But you can take love and generosity and communism and justice and peace 
and all the rest, that survives just fine when you take the leap of faith into the world that is breaking in in Jesus. Now, in writing this sermon, I was intent to give you the good news about money. I didn't want to just leave you with a commandment, go share more stuff. I mean, you've heard that a thousand times. Maybe it does some good, maybe not. I don't know. But I didn't want to just leave you with a commandment. I want to give you the good news around money. The good news of what it means that in Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God is breaking into this world. And so, here it is. You can't take it with you. But you don't need to. You can't take it with you. But you don't need to. There was a very rich man, another very rich man who was just about to die, and he also wanted to take some of his wealth with him. So he started negotiations with God about this matter. God was not sure about this, as it had never been done before, and God did not want to set a precedence about taking it with you. But this man was very persuasive, was very good at arguing with God. And so finally, after long talks, God reluctantly agreed to allow him to bring his wealth to heaven. And so just a few days before he died, the rich man converted all of his money into gold bricks. He died, and the funeral home made sure that the suitcases containing all that gold went with him. And sure enough, he arrived at the pearly gates with his suitcases, chugging them along, and he met St. Peter there at the gates, and Peter told him that he could not bring the suitcases full of gold bullion into heaven. But the man said that he had already spoken with God and that God said it was okay. So Peter got on the phone, checked with God to make sure this wasn't just a made-up story, and God said, yes, it's true, I agreed to it. Peter, though, was curious about what was so valuable that the man wanted to bring it into heaven. Peter said, can I just take a peek into those suitcases that you're carrying. So the man opened the suitcases and Peter exclaimed, why are you bringing pavement into heaven? I see I have to explain it a little more. Got it? The streets of heaven paved with gold. The man thinks that he can bring his own gold, but he's just bringing the equivalent of asphalt because you really can't take it with you because you don't need to. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.